Before we launch into the double integration area, we must uh, first have confidence in evaluating the different integrals of single variable functions. Well, there are many techniques, but some of them that are commonly encountered are being considered now. A few illustrations will help you to not only understand, but also use during double integrations. So the first problem that I have selected is a straightforward one. The integration of x e for x squared within the limits 1 to 2. Of course, it's not that straightforward. You will have to think of a substitution. So we will replace x squared with a new variable. Say u. Take differentials on both sides. You get 2 times x dx is equal to du. And if you notice, we have x dx already. So we'll just shift the coefficient 2 to the right hand side. But that is not enough. We'll have to also change the limits of integration because the new variable u is entering the problem. So using this equation, I will derive the values of u corresponding to x is equal to 1 and x is equal to 2. For x is equal to 1, u will be 1. For x is equal to 2, u will be 2 squared, which is 4. So with these changes, let us see how this integral transforms. So I write i is equal to integral u from 1 to 4, e power x square is now e power u and x times dx is du upon 2. So we have full control over the situation now, right, half times 1 to 4 e power u du, this is half time e power u from 1 to 4, this is half e power 4 minus e. Even though this may appear a very simple question that has been demonstrated, but these things do arise once in a way, even in double integrals. My next example will be a direct application of reduction rules that we see in uh, the evaluation of trigonometric functions. So let us say we have an integral 0 to pi by 2 sin power 4x dx or the integral from 0 to pi by 2 cos power 4x dx. Both of them yield the same results. You can uh, actually see the graph of both these things to get convinced, but the sine function and the cos function in 0 to pi by 2 will have similar graphs with a shift. So without having to do both of them separately, we can directly use the direct principle. So if you recall, the principle that was explained earlier, both of them produce the same result, which can be written like this. There is a numerator having 3 multiplied by 1 and the denominator 4 multiplied by 2 multiplied by something else. Now first of all, how did we write these numbers? When you have the 0 to pi by 2 integrals for sine or cos with positive integer powers, you start with a number less than that number in the numerator. 4 reduced by 1, you get 3. 
then the successor reduction by two numbers, so three reduces to one. Of course, don't do the mistake of reducing further by two, you get into a negative zone, don't do that. And then uh, the denominator starts with that power itself, and then again the reduction is by two units. Again, don't do the mistake of extending it beyond two because you will end up writing a zero. So you should never get into the negative zone, nor you should end with a zero. So it stops here. And because this is an even power, we just have to also multiply with pi. I know this is elementary stuff, but we need these things when we uh, do problems on double integrations. So the output will be p pi upon 16, irrespective of whether it is a sine power 4 problem or a cos power. My third example is what would happen when both a sine function and a cos function come together as a product in the range 0 to pi by 2. So again, there are direct principles. There is a direct principle. You first focus on the power of sine. Again, as explained before, start with one number less. So, 3 minus 1 is 2. Then reduction by two numbers, but that will take you to 0. Don't do that. You can use a bracket for that. Then go to the power of cos. Start with a number less. Do a reduction by two numbers. 3 times 1. Don't go beyond that. That explains the numerator. Then the denominator, you start with the sum of these two powers, then keep reducing 2 at a time, 7, 5, 3, 1 is also allowed, not beyond that. And now comes the main point. When you find any one of these two powers, any one of these two powers odd, as it's happening here, don't write pi by 2, you write 1. So what happens when both of them are even? You multiply with the pi by 2. Okay. So, whatever is this answer? So, let's see how it ends. A 3 can get cancelled here. So, we are left with 2 upon 35. And not only this, suppose we swap the powers of sine and cos in the same 0 to pi by 2 range, the output is still the same. So, these principles you have already learned are not 0 to pi by 2. So, in this case, I am taking a problem where the limits are 0 to pi and I have taken a problem where the power of the sine function or the power of cos function is an even number. Let us say power 4, 4 or 6 or 10 or anything like that. So whenever you have a 0 to pi integral where the power of sine or cos is even, you will get a non-zero output. So this can be reduced. to a 0 to pi by 2 integral. Not only in this case, but even in the cosine case, the same thing happens. Mind you, only when the power of cos function is even, you can do 2 times 0 to pi by 2 of the cosine function. But what about the sine function in the 0 to pi range, whether sine carries an odd power or even power, you can always write 2 times 0 to pi by 2. So the output will be the same, 2 times as explained earlier, it is 3 multiplied by 1, 4 multiplied by 2, that's an even number. So don't forget you should also multiply with pi by 2. So we can cancel off a 2 and then your result will be 3 pi divided by 8. Now let us add a little bit of complexity. What will happen to a 0 to pi cos power 5 h dx problem? If you have heard my synopsis carefully, in the 0 to pi range, whenever cos carries 
and odd power, the output is straight away zero. Whereas in the zero to pi range, sine power 5x dx can be converted as 2 times 0 to pi by 2 sine power 5x dx. You can see contrasting examples here. 0 to pi cos with an odd power, the output is 0. 0 to pi sine with an odd power is converted is as 2 times 0 to pi by 2 sine power 5. And then the reduction is as before. 4 times 2, 4 multiplied by 2, 5, 3, 1, then odd power, you don't have to further multiply with 5 by 2. And 16 upon 15 is the output. In my next example, let me go to a 0 to 2 pi situation where I have, let us say, sine power 4x, but I'll make it some cos power 7x dx. In the 0 to 2 pi range, observe the power of sine and cos. Any one of them is odd. Don't waste your time. The output is 0. Remember, it happens only 0 to 2 pi. What I'm trying to tell you is, 0 to 2 pi sine power 7x cos power 4x dx is also 0. So in 0 to 2 pi, whether it is cos or sine which carries an odd power or both carry odd powers, the output is 0. Then coming to the next example where we have integral minus pi by 2 to pi by 2. Let us say a sine power 11x problem. Of course, we don't see so many problems, so these types of questions arising in the double integrations, but let us not rule out possibilities. So when you have a minus pi by 2 to pi by 2, or in general, a minus k to k problem, with such a situation, the output is 0 because this sine x is an odd function. Not only that, sine x to an odd power is also odd. So whenever you have an odd function from minus a to a or minus k to k, the output is just 0. But let us see what happens when you have a minus pi by 2 to pi by 2 sine power 12x dx. Now, even though sine x is odd, but sine x to the power of 12 is an even function. So, you should understand the intricacies. So, what if it's even? This gets converted as 2 times 0 to pi by 2 sine x power 12 dx and the rest the reduction rule will take care 11 9 7 5 3 1 upon 12 10 8 6 4 2 don't forget you should also multiply with 5 by 2 because it's an even power Getting the final output is not of any great interest now, but how do you do this business is what I'm trying to explain to you. In this presentation, I will take some examples where you will have to draw the uh, graphs of the functions that are given to you. And once the curves and lines are drawn, you see what type of region is formed, whether the region can be described as an Rx region or an Rby region. As explained earlier, Rx regions can be trapped between vertical lines and Ry regions can be trapped between horizontal lines. So let me take my first example where we have two curves x square is equal to 4y and y is equal to x. x square is equal to 4y 
vertical parabola. And y is equal to x with a straight line to origin. I hope all of you have a decent knowledge of uh, fundamental curves. And this problem involves a parabola and a straight line. So let me draw the graph. This is x square is equal to four y, and this is y is equal to x. So x square is equal to four y, and y is equal to x. When you solve these two equations, of course they will intersect at the origin, and the origin satisfies both the equations. And the next one will be 4 comma 4. Again, you can easily guess that because 4 comma 4 satisfies both the equations. Otherwise, we can solve these two equations by eliminating any one variable. So let us state the reason. Now, whether we should call this an Rx region or an R region will depend upon how you see it. Question number one Can you trap the region between? Vertical lines. Let us try. So these are the two possibilities. So let us uh, indicate the corner points. Can I see this region between vertical lines? The answer is yes, because between these two vertical lines, I've got a very clear single lower curve and a clear upper curve. There are no intersections in between. That's one of the requirements of an RX region. Between the vertical lines, the lower and upper curves should not intersect. If they intersect, it means it is not a single RX region. In such a case, one may try to express it as an RY region by trying to trap the region between horizontal lines. So, it's a very clear Rx example. So, let us see. The vertical line equations are x is equal to 0, x is equal to 1. This is the lower curve. Don't forget, you must write that as y as a function of x. And this also y as a function of x. Now, the upper curve is a straight line that is already given to you in the problem directly. So, y is equal to x is that equation. But be careful with the lower boundary. The lower boundary is a parabolic boundary. So, go to the equation of the parabola and write y as a function of x. So, that would be y is equal to x square by 2. So, this Rx region can be put in notation x is equal to 0 to x is equal to 4, not 1, so x is equal to 4, semicolon, y is equal to x square by 4, so y is equal to x. And it is in the same order you fix the limits of integration before you begin to evaluate. But is this the only way to express this region? Can I not try and put it or trap it between horizontal lines? Let us see. Again, I will draw my coordinate axis. These are the regions. Let me show the corner points. Let me also shade the region. And suppose I draw the horizontal line there. This, of course, already existing with the horizontal line now. So, this region is trapped between two horizontal lines. And what is more important is, between these two horizontal lines, the so-called left curve and the right curve do not intersect each other. That's the significance or that's the uh, 
uh, characteristic of an Arduino engine. Between the horizontal, the left and right curves should not be intersected. If they intersect, you try to put it as an RX region. So here it's a very clear case of uh, an R y region also. So let us write the equations. Let, this is y is equal to zero, and this is y is equal to four coming from there. And then the left curve, don't forget, should be written like this: x as a function of y. It is x is equal to y because this line is y is equal to x, and the right curve should be x is equal to coming from the parabola equation, positive square root of why positive square root because the parabola also has got a left branch that will be the negative square root but that does not exist in this plot. We have only have the right uh, branch so therefore we take the positive square root. So this is the same as writing 2 square root over the so this region in notation can written as Ry, y is equal to 0 to y is equal to 4, but this line to that line. And then comes the left boundary and the right boundary, x is equal to y, x is equal to 2 square root over y. And you fix the limits in the same order before you begin to evaluate. So, this is a very simple region which can be expressed as both Rx and Ry. Now, given a problem which is better, that is difficult to decide unless you see what is the function that you are going to integrate. So, when we take up solving problems, you will find how to decide whether you should pick up an Rx configuration or an Ry configuration. So, this is about my first example which is very, very straightforward.